Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth installment of our speaker series, Identity and Belonging in a Global Age, sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity in Transition. I'm Shahrazad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU and co-director of the Center on Modernity in Transition. And I'm Benjamin Shul, and together with Sharzad, I direct the Center on Modernity and Transition. So questions of collective identity and belonging have surged to prominence in recent years. This speaker series brings together leading thinkers to examine the crises of identity that confront us in a rapidly changing global age, and to think deeply about how humanity might resolve them. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Barbara Fields and Derek Smith, to discuss identity, justice, and the future of race. Barbara Fields is professor in the Department of History at Columbia University. Her books include Slavery and Freedom on the Middle Ground, Maryland during the 19th century, and Racecraft, the Soul of Inequality in American Life. Derek Smith is associate professor of literature at Claremont McKenna College. He is the author of Robert Hayden and Verse, New Histories of African American Poetry in the Black Arts Era. Barbara, Derek, a very warm welcome to you both. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks. So um, as I think Derek, you know, you were part of our series last year, we like to begin our conversations uh, on a bit more of an intimate biographical note. So to start, I'd like to ask each of you to tell us a bit about what were some of the personal and intellectual pathways that led you to think and write about questions at the intersection of identity, justice, and race. Uh, Derek, maybe we can begin with you. Uh, thanks, Ben, Sharza. It's an honor to be here with you, uh, Barbara. And um, yeah, so, you know, I grew up in the Virgin Islands in the in the 1980s and 90s. And of course, that's a, a kind of unusual place. It's in the heart of the Caribbean, but it's a territory of the United States. So, you know, we kind of talk with a little bit of an accent, you know, like a Caribbean person. But, you know, we have a representative in the U.S. Congress. And uh, not a congressperson per se, but a delegate in the House of Representatives who doesn't vote, but who can participate in congressional debate and so forth. And so we're subject to U.S. federal law. So it's a strange kind of like political representation. It suggests some things about the cultural and political context of the Virgin Islands. And yeah, I got our license plate. It, it used to say America's paradise. Now I think it says um, uh, America's Caribbean. You know, I, so I grew up in a period, though, when, when anti-colonial sentiment and, like, politics of decolonization was still pretty significant uh, to the culture of the Caribbean. And in the music, of course, you know, what you might call the street politics that influenced me. So, uh, for example, like, I remember playing on this basketball team. It was called the Roughnecks. And um, our coach was just a few years older than, than me. Um, he would have probably described himself as a Rastafarian. You know, he said, put your John Hancock on this paper here. This is a participation form. And then he said, no, 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 don't put your John Hancock on the paper, put your Shaka Zulu on the paper here. So growing up in that kind of environment, you know, in which the politics of Black or Pan-African resistance was a very powerful, you know, it shaped me, you know, you're out and about at the basketball court or wherever, and all the guys who you look up to, you know, have dreadlocks and are playing anthems to Marcus Garvey and so forth. Um, but I was also um, raised in the Baha'i faith, you know, by parents who were not from the Virgin Islands. And they moved there just after I was born to support the small Baha'i community in the islands. And I had a home life that was very uh, ensconced in the faith, in that Baha'i faith with principles of the oneness of humanity and race unity and so forth. Um, my mother had come from Germany in 1960 and she was 18 years old had grown up in the in the war time uh you know she never spoke about it uh, after living in the u.s for about 10 years she met my father who's from a, a large african-american family that had migrated from south georgia to michigan in the 30s and on my dad's side my my uh my grandparents you know they, they didn't have formal education my grandfather couldn't read or write um but they managed to send all the kids to children, uh, all, the, all the children to college. And um, so my parents met in the University of Michigan, became Baha'i soon after that, moved to the Virgin Islands. So I think my own interest in race and justice and identity and so forth uh, come out of personal history. I think I went to graduate school, wrote a dissertation on African-American poetry and the aesthetics and politics of this Baha'i poet, uh, Robert Hayden. 
um, and his relationship to a black radical tradition or his distance from that tradition in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, working through that, um, you know, I think I was working through my own questions about race and self-representation and religion and social transformation and so forth. Thanks very much, Derek. So Barbara, maybe you can share a bit about your path to the themes we're talking about today. Uh, my, my path actually uh, le led me askew of some of those themes, and this is going to come up, I imagine, during our conversations. I would say the most significant of my uh, youthful influences along these lines was spending a year between college and graduate school in Tanzania in East Africa. Uh, that meant that I was in a country with a black majority, but where American notions of race just simply did not apply. And I, I learned that in various ways. And I think it was one of the reasons that when I came back and went to graduate school, uh, I began very skeptical about the whole concept of race and the way scholars use it. In Tanzania, for example, I learned very quickly as I learned Swahili, I learned that the words for black and white in Swahili, mweusi, mweupe, were never used as a way of, of classifying people's ancestry, purely descriptive. You wanted to talk about someone's national belonging, then you called them Wafrika, an African. Mzungu, who could be a European or an American, Wamerika. But black and white were descriptors the way blonde and brunette might be here. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean that there was no experience among Tanzanians of racism. After all, having uh, come out of a colonial experience, how could they not have it? But it was different. And I think it was very salutary for an American to be in a place where uh, you couldn't help realizing that American definitions and American assumptions just did not apply. Hmm. Well, thank you both for, for sharing some of that more personal and, and very interesting background with us. Uh, Barbara, I want to begin, as so many conversations with you do, by asking about some of the core arguments that you and Karen Fields advance in your seminal book of essays, Racecraft, The Soul of Inequality in American Life. You argue in that book that it is not race that has led to racism, but rather it is the repeated act of racism that has created and continues to create the fiction of race. One of the key points that you make is that the concept of race transforms the act of racism, that is the act of the perpetrator, into a characteristic of the target. As you put it, race transforms one person's action into another person's being. Can you tell us more about that? What is racecraft? And what are some of its implications for how we understand or perhaps how we should understand race and identity? Uh, the way I tell my students what racecraft is, is I say it is the, the social process by which racism becomes race. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the, and I wrestle with them, um, throughout the classes that I teach about this because being Americans and having grown up here, they find it very difficult to shed the habits of thought as well as of, of mm -hmm. language that go along with being true believers in race. Uh, one of the, the habits that uh, illustrates this is thinking of racist discrimination as something that happens to someone because of the color of their skin. And that has become part of American language, partly because of Martin Luther King saying uh, that children should not be, little children shouldn't be persecuted because of the color of their skin. I don't actually think Martin Luther King meant that to be taken as literally as people have taken it. He didn't for one moment think that black people were persecuted because of the color of their skin. It's not because of something in black people. 
It's because of something in the racists, in the perpetrators. And he, he spoke of the color of, uh, of someone's skin by way of showing how ridiculous it was, uh, that that should be regarded as, as a reason to do something. And yet it's hard to get away from that in our, uh, in our uh, society and in our culture. The habit of saying that things happen, this happens to black and brown people, reinforces that. And I'm not saying we, we shouldn't talk that way because obviously people do, but it does reinforce a habit of thinking that it's something in the targets rather than an action by the, the uh, aggressor. You know, it's like saying, well, what was wrong with the Jews that got them persecuted? You know, that's the wrong way to ask the question. And racecraft is a, a way to produce the illusion, that illusion that is really turned around so that it's back to front. Um, and it, it is so much a part of people's experience in our society that we don't notice the process by which it happens. Um, I don't know if that helps <laughs> to uh, explain what we, we mean by racecraft, but it certainly, to me, one, one example that I use with my students, uh, not an example, it, it's a, uh, a, a kind of metaphor, doesn't work, an, an analogy that doesn't work fully, but I tell them about the uh, apparatus that conjurers used to use, maybe they still do, in sideshows and circuses and so on, um, in which the conjurer purports to cut a woman in half. And uh, people gape at that and they think, and they, and they see she appears to be cut in half at the end. Uh, but when the show is over, she reappears as a whole person. And I tell my students that racecraft is a bit like that apparatus. A whole woman goes in, a woman sawed in two comes out the other end, but it has all been an illusion. Um, and racecraft is like that with the difference that at the end of the sideshow, the woman came back, always came back on stage intact. Whereas racecraft produces an illusion that does not go away. And you don't need a conjurer for it because the people who, who uh, are the observers of racecraft are both the conjurers and the audience. Thank you, Barbara. Derek, resonant with Barbara's argument, you write about how exploitative power relations always require a justificatory narrative. More specifically, you write about the massive and thoroughgoing ideological apparatus that arose alongside the centuries long theft and exploitation of human life perpetrated through the enslavement of black people. One of the things I find most powerful about the arguments both you and Barbara present is that they help us to understand in a historically and sociologically sophisticated way, the contingency of race and thereby provide insight into the possibility of transformative change. Here, how can an understanding of the origin and perpetuation of race constructively inform our profound ongoing struggle with race and racism today? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of us follow the adage of you know, always historicize. And I think that that makes uh, sense when thinking about race and social transformation. And, you know, I think it's important to begin conversations about race craft and blackness and white supremacy and so forth at some point before what most people think of as the initial glimmerings of modernity. Um, you know, I have a personal kind of project that I bring out at the beginning of each semester with my students and sometimes when I'm doing uh, kind of talks or whatever, and I call it the 1319 project. And so rather than start class 
uh, about black cultural production in America with a date like 1619 as a frame of reference. I always try to start in what some people call African antiquity in the Islamic kingdom of Mali at the beginnings of this spectacular reign of Mansa Musa, you know, and, and starting a story about blackness in a period before the emergence of the modern conception of race, I think does a few things. You know, it widens the imaginations, which I think is so important, you know, for us. And it, it does things like disrupt the enlightenment narrative that Africans had no consequential history before the transatlantic slave trade and that there was no tradition of literacy or recognizable intellectual culture in, in West Africa. But I think for our purposes here, it's, it's, it sets the stage for a deepened understanding of what uh, Blackness is by pointing to a particular people, you know, the Mandinka and their relations to other West African people in a period before modern conceptions of race had crystallized. And I think that, you know, you can, we can lose sight of some of what, you know, you talk about as a contingency of race um, when we talk about uh, uh, Africans only after they stepped foot onto North America in 1619, at a time when anti-Black racecraft had already had some time to develop um, in, in sort of in the period of, you know, the early period of New World slavery. And I also think that here in the U.S., uh, if we always start our conversation about um, race in 1619 or in North America, we can't forget that race and anti-Blackness is a global mythology, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's, its undoing will necessarily be a global project. Um, you, you know, like if we start at our earlier period of time, um, I think that, that we begin to grasp intellectually that the that that the idea in the early uh, centuries of of new world modernity, um, you know, that that came up um, so that so that so that wealth could be built up in European metropoles, right? You know, the European miracle, the great divergence, as historians have called it was the outcome of this stolen labor of Mandinka people and Igbo people and Hausa people and Fulani people and Wolof and Umbundu and all these kind of people, right? So these millions of souls were engaged in the making of the new world. But to facilitate that new world process, these diverse people were turned into black people, right? And, you know, Huguenots or Basque people, they, Dutch people, so forth, they, they came under uh, uh, this, this category of whiteness. And I think that this long durée approach to racism, you know, and the production of race is helpful because it allows us to understand um, that race is both a divisive category, right? But it's also a coherent category. You know, it brought, you know, it brought, it brought all these people together. And if I can think about race as something that supplanted other categories, it gives me hope that, you know, race might too be supplanted with other conceptual categories, you know, capable of cohering huma humanity as we go forward, you know, into the future. Um, so I think I, I just want to also bring in like one other idea from like the Afro pessimist school of thought, you know, that helps me think about the construction and the contingency of the category of race. And it's, it's, it's related to this you know, the world making process of the transatlantic slave trade. And, you know, Frank Wilderson, who's kind of like thought of as the center of that school of thought, has this idea that there's a difference between the, the Jewish Holocaust of, of World War II and, you know, the middle passage of the transatlantic slave trade. So Jewish people, he says, went into the Holocaust and emerged as Jewish people. And Africans went into the transatlantic slave trade and emerged as Black people. And so um, you know, I end in a very different place than Wilderson and, and the, and the pessimist, pessimists, but I think that that helps, that idea helps us to sense that the horror of the transatlantic slave trade, you know, and, the, and this torture system and exploitation system, it fed an incredibly productive uh, 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 process, you know, it essentially produced the new world and it produced blackness as we know it and therefore race as we know it. And, you know, I'll, well, I, let me just, uh, I'll stop. <laughs> let me, let me stop there. And, and may, may I ask a question, uh, uh, Derek? Absolutely. When, when you're talking to your students about 1319, do you or do they consider that there was a notion of blackness then? 
Well, we talk about the notion of blackness, you know, it has in, in relationship to sort of Islamic empire that is, um, would have been East of West Africa, right? And so of course there were these categories of race that had, a, had been established uh, already. There was some sense of it. What I, what I always argue for the students is that um, the ways, the, the intense forms of stigma that got attached to that category with the advent of the transatlantic slave trade uh, had not coalesced at that point. Did you want to add to that or, or respond, Barbara? Oh, only to say that um, it, it seems to me that um, if, if you look at, from what I know, and this is second and third and fourth hand, of languages spoken by indigenous Americans before Europeans and even after. Um, they didn't have a term for Indians. There wasn't any such thing. And the terms that they used to refer to their own uh, nation or tribe usually were terms that in their language means people. Yeah, because that's who, that's who they were. They were people. And the idea that uh, because uh, Europeans and others later uh, applied these terms to people that, that they must have had an indigenous origin is, is wrong. Nobody thinks of, of himself or herself or uh, his or her group in those terms until forced to do, the, do so by a juxtaposition. And that's the historical part that that uh, Derek is insisting on, I think. Um, and when I uh, talk, talk to my students about 1619, and I did even before the 1619 project, but I had to do it more pointedly after the 1619 project because of all the nonsense that that engendered, uh, starting with how can you begin in 1619? <laughs> and ignore 167 because starting in 167 when when white people were servants indentured servants in virginia who could be bought they were chattels who could be bought and sold who could be won and lost in card games and so on uh, starting there lets you see that the uh, uh, decision to uh, use Africans as slaves came in that context. And it didn't become racial, wasn't even defined that way in, in the laws of Virginia until much later on. Well, from, from 1619, uh, when do you first even have a slave code in Virginia? Not till the 1660s. And uh, I, this is a, a a misconception that I think has become very widespread is likely to become even more widespread because the New York Times has made such a mascot of it. But uh, if you, historicizing that process means that you have to understand everybody who was part of it. it and it wasn't just people from Africa, it wasn't just people from Europe, it wasn't just um, indigenous Americans. You have to understand all of those and you have to understand why it was necessary to have people forced to work for somebody else. Why do you need to do that? If you have a place where anybody who wants land can get land, anybody who wants to grow whatever the crop is can grow it, why do you end up having indentured servitude and slavery? Um, and I put this question to my students and they flounder around about it because they have all sorts of notions of what comes naturally to human beings. And um, I tell them, well, ultimately, there, there are only three ways you can get somebody else to work for you, uh, for your benefit. You can persuade them to do it, you can pay them to do it, or you can force them to do it. Uh, and it is very difficult to pay people enough to want to do that if what they want is to farm their own land and there's nothing to stop them from doing that uh, and nothing to stop them from appropriating the proceeds. 
as soon as you historicize it that way, the, uh, slavery becomes part of, of a, a historical process that uh, does, it doesn't have anything to do with race as Americans like to understand it. And the process by which, and I, I tell my students, you know, uh, people from Africa didn't become black people until they came here. But for that matter, Europeans were not Europeans <laughs> until they came here. Uh, Derek, do you want to respond to that directly briefly? I'm sure we'll come back to these themes, but I want to, I want to give you a chance. No, only, only to say, right, that that process of historicization just allows us to recognize, I think, in more meaningful ways, the constructedness of these categories, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, as, as Barbara was saying, right, all of these West Africans were incredibly diverse. They had differences between them. They thought about themselves as different people and then, you know, get amalgamated into this category for the purposes of, you know, the economic interests of a few, you know, in the development of the new world. So, I mean, I just think that um, that that's just that's the reality of it, and and somehow our discourse has come to be one that um, is, is not so cognizant of that reality. And and you know, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add to that that uh, the people who bought and sold slaves also had no illusion that these were all the same people. Right. Yeah, they would they would reject some. They wanted to buy others, you know, because they understood that there were differences, even if the way they looked at those differences might be uh, uh, ill-informed and stereotypical sometime, but uh, the illusion that all black people were the same, they were all black people is something that comes much later than their advent in the new world. Well, let's, let's move on to the next question. I'm sure these themes will, will uh, reemerge in various ways. Barbara, in a symposium last year, you and I had a conversation in which you made some powerful observations about our prevailing conceptions of race. And I'd like to go back to some of those specific comments and bring them into the context of this conversation. You observed, for example, that in thinking about justice, we often engage in what the political science scientist Adolf Reed has called disparity thinking. Um, as you put it, quote, if you take disparity thinking to its logical terminus, then black people will have achieved justice when unarmed and innocent and uncharged with a crime. They are shot dead by the police in exactly the proportion that they make up of the population. And when innocent white people are shot dead by the police in the same proportion that they make up of the population, end quote. You continued, and I, I quote again, as soon as you put it like this, it's obvious that that's not what we're after. We don't want injustice and oppression and cruelty visited upon people in exactly the proportion that they represent of the population. We want to get rid of those things. You followed those comments by expressing um, your disapproval of the widely used term racial justice. Racial justice, you explained, and I'm quoting again, is to justice as half-truth is to truth. Racial justice is not a kind of justice, it's a type of injustice. If you think about it, racial justice is exactly what segregationists considered themselves to be administering, the justice that's appropriate for Black people." End quote. Now, these observations, I think, strikingly expose, first, how distorted and impoverished our prevailing conceptions of justice can be. And second, how that distortion and impoverishment stems at least in some measure from a failure to grasp and appreciate the wholeness and interdependence of human relationships. Barbara, what's wrong with the ways in which justice is typically conceptualized? And more importantly, how can we do better? What positive conception of justice would you offer? Well, first of all, I, uh, when we had that conversation, I, uh, I meant to credit the, the uh, student of mine who's actually the first person who put it in those terms. Uh, 
and uh, and I've understood it that way ever since. Uh, that is Michael R. West. We have two historians who are named Michael West. <laughs> one is Michael O and the other is Michael R. This one is Michael R. And he was the one who uh, first crystallized that racial justice is exactly what segregation uh, was about as far as segregationists were concerned. And uh, the idea that uh, racial, that there can be such a thing as racial just racial justice is a form of racism. It's a way of administering racism. Uh, how do you, how you get beyond that is probably a bigger question than I can tackle, but I do want to say this uh, with an example that comes from the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these ugly things come from here, so I'm happy to have one that comes from the UK. Uh, a child of 14 or 15 in a public school in London was strip searched after her teachers thought that they smelled marijuana on her and they searched her book bag and they didn't find any marijuana. So then they called the police who proceeded to strip search her to the uh, degree that they even uh, required her to bend over and spread her buttocks so that they could examine them. Don't ask me what they could have been looking for and what smelling like marijuana had to do with that. But for me, the point is that in the outrage that ensued about this, the key question, at least for school authorities and especially for the police, seemed to be, is this something that would have happened to a white child? In other words, is this racism? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that's the worst example, one of the worst examples I've heard of disparity thinking. If you can't decide whether this needs to be denounced until you, you satisfied yourself that it was racist, when in fact, any child, that the idea that that should happen to any child is outrageous and it shouldn't depend on whether you can call it racism. It shouldn't depend on whether you can uh, add uh, the, the racist enhancement to make this a worse crime. No, no, no. <laughs> Abusing a child in that way is outrageous and whether it's done with a racist motivation or some other motivation, that's all, all we need to know is that this has happened to a child. And I say that because our, uh, I think it, it, it is becoming even more, what shall I call it, uh, current to insist on thinking in these terms, whether uh, we can call this the product of racism or a hate crime and not deal with it as what it is, I think that is uh, an indication that we're actually leaning away from conceiving of justice in a way that would uh, befit uh, a human society. Many years ago, Barrington Moore, uh, who was sort of indirectly a teacher of mine when I was an undergraduate, Barrington Moore published a book with a very long title, uh, Reflections on the Causes of Human Misery and Upon Certain Proposals to Eliminate Them. And it's, it, it's a short, very thoughtful, in the end, quite pessimistic book. But the one uh, thing that I remember uh, strikingly from that book that actually is not pessimistic is Barrington Moore's uh, observation that people, if you ask people what will make them happy, the answers are so various that you can't actually get anywhere like that. But he said, if you try to think of the things that make people miserable, there's pretty broad agreement about what those are. Nobody wants to be subjected to uh, the sort of things that uh, make most people miserable. Uh, starvation, 
and privation, war, uh, having people you care about arbitrarily killed, being persecuted because of your beliefs and so on. Um, most people would see those things as things that make them miserable, therefore as injustices. We may not have somewhere to start with a, with a uh, holistic conception of justice, but we do have somewhere we can start in conceiving of injustice. Derek, you've, you've also uh, been critical of this disparity thinking approach to justice, let's call it. For instance, imagining uh, justice as the proportional representation of racial groups in the socioeconomic classes of society. On this point, you've written, um, and I'm quoting, while there is certainly some virtue in this restricted vision, it appears to assume that the current world capitalist order is fundamentally sound and that with some racial rejiggering, all will be well." End quote. Uh, instead, Derek, you urge a framework for action that challenges, as you put it, the most fundamental premises of human relations in the contemporary order. What are these fundamental premises of human relations that you believe we need to question and how will reimagining them yield a more powerful conception of justice? So I will start with the disparity thinking that um, it seems like Adolf Reed and Walter Ben Michaels have, you know, and, you know, I think that uh, I don't, I don't think that that kind of thinking is going to get to salutary ends or the justice that that we want. Um, but I, I, you know, I have some sympathy for those who kind of use it as a lever within the existing political structure. And I think that many who subscribe to that style of thinking, they look at capitalist liberal democracy and accept that that's the prevailing order and then they work within it. And you know, my own belief is that we're currently working within a prevailing order that's manifestly and lamentably defective, dysfunctional, and it's not structured in a way that's gonna bring us to a meaningful form of justice. Um, and, and um, you know, you mentioned that some who abide by disparity thinking might believe that we arrive at justice when there's proportional representation of racial groups in the various socioeconomic strata of society and so forth. And there's also like people who will look at the criminal justice system and desire to see proportional representation of racial groups in that system, right? And they say to themselves, yeah. I can see that black people are disproportionately targeted by our punitive justice system. And if I continually bring light to that disproportionality, then, po then policies could get shifted, right? So that um, like fewer black people will be subject to harm. And you know, sometimes they, you could call this racial justice. Other times they say, this is called for equal justice. But I think whether you, know, you call it racial justice or equal justice, what's important is like the apparatus of justice that we're appealing to to, it's gonna give us some justice, right? And I think when a lot of people call for equal justice, they're hoping just that everyone will be equally treated by the apparatus of justice that prevails in you know, our, 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 our society, our, our, our liberal capitalist democracy. Um, but of course, anyone who takes a fair-minded look at that apparatus as it exists right now would recognize that the retributive system of justice that we currently have isn't structured in a way that it will allow it to produce a society characterized by actual justice. In, in fact, from my opinion, you know, it's, it's meant to uphold and maintain a society characterized by injustice, right? So, you know, a lot of this comes from the last 10 years that I've been, I've been teaching inside of prisons in New York and California. And, you know, what's evident in there, to my mind, is that whether they're black or white or Latino or what have you, there's this thread that binds together 90% of the people who are locked up. And that's that they come from contexts where there's very little material resources, right? So I see it, you know, as I said, our justice system is primarily an instrument for punishing poor people and warehousing like surplus labor that's likely to disrupt the prevailing American order. It's not a system that's meant to create a just society. It's a system that's meant to perpetuate an unjust society. Right. Mm -hmm. And it extends and exacerbates social harm. So to bring it back to disparity thinking and powerful conceptions of justice, you know, I think it's clear that we don't we don't need a system that's going to target more white people. Right. Or target 
richer people even. You know, we, we don't need a retributive system at all that targets different racial or economic groups than it's targeting right now. We need a restorative system that addresses social harms and that strengthens social bonds. So in a world building project, you know, that would supplant the existing order that's racist and exploitative and so forth, we need to operate with restorative principles. And so then to take it down to those fundamental principles of human relations that you asked about, you know, I think in systems of restorative justice that would need to characterize a truly just society, you need to have faith in the fundamental nobility of people, right? Even those who have committed harms against others. And this is of course challenging in the context of Western modernity, which first of all teaches us that human beings are inevitably and maybe incorrigibly self-interested and that certain categories of human beings, chiefly among those black people are fundamentally ignoble, right? And so these are the premises that in the American context build up and sustain what some people are calling these days, like the criminal legal system, you know? And so again, in the American context, if we're thinking about getting closer to a truly just society, we can't just eliminate racial disparity within the criminal legal system as it currently exists. We actually need to build up a criminal justice system that operates according to restorative principles and which are premised in my mind on the belief that all people are fundamentally noble and that nobility can be fostered and cultivated through social systems that actually bring out that nobility which is in within within all of us you know so i'll stop yeah so Derek and Barbara, I wanted to continue with this theme that you've both already touched upon, um, which is the relationship between justice, um, race, and the current or historic uh, socioeconomic order in which we live today. So Derek, in a recent article you had written, and I'm quoting how hoary American anti-blackness and identity-based chauvinisms now operate in service of an evolved capitalist order, which relies on an ambient feeling of insecurity a sense of socioeconomic precarity among almost all citizens of the neoliberal state. Relatedly, Barbara, as you'd already mentioned, you trace the origins of racecraft, the impulse of early American plantation owners to justify their replacement of the labor of European indentured servants who increasingly clamored for political rights with that of African slaves. Both of your analyses help clarify the relationship between capitalism, broadly construed, um, not only to the category of race, but also just to questions of human identity and identity formation more broadly. So I'd ask if you could both elaborate on this relationship between race, identity making, and the shared structures and norms and practices that undergird the current capitalist socioeconomic order. And how might these observations help us think differently about how to create a society that's characterized by um, a more capacious or coherent um, pattern of justice? Um, so Derek, we can begin with you. So as I see it, you, as I've tried to explain, you know, from my view, you know, conceptions of race that now influence the world, you know, the idea that I have a race and you have a race, and that tells us something about our essential identity, those came into being alongside the emergence of a trope of a, of a, of a, uh, like a truly globalized system of capitalism, you know, where you have trade in all parts of the world. At that time, that's a, happening at the time of the rise of, of, uh, of race. Um, and, and, and also the nation state system is like, that's all going on at the same time, this early period of modernity. And, you know, the, the, the rise of, so the socioeconomic order of modernity was facilitated by the mythology of race. I think that's, you know, we, we, that's just a truth at this point, I think, you know, and, and, and it, it was facilitated, it, race facilitated exploitation. Right. And those people who were most exploited, the Mandinka, Igbo, Hausa, and so forth, like all those people who were enslaved, formed the bottom of the labor supply. And that labor supply was worth whatever it cost to purchase, feed, and house those people. That's it. And so, with the emergence of global trade, there is the crystallization of this facilitating category of blackness. And that, that blackness, that people in that category set the baseline value of labor at zero, right? And that then depressed the labor for non-Blacks as well. People weren't put in that category. Um, so that category served the interests of capital and it produced, and it was produced by greed, right? 
Um, sometimes you will hear people say that racism is America's original sin, but I think that that kind of idea clouds the work of like Dr. Fields and others, right? That make clear that greed is the original sin and racism, racism is like the residual sin, right? Um, but but the racism and the anti-blackness and white supremacy that was that was conjured in service of of the project of exploitation was massive, right? And it was massive, I think, because the economic exploitation was so massive. And to to facilitate such the, an expansive and extensive um, um, system of exploitation, you needed a, an equally expansive and extensive and mutable justifying narrative. And that massive and, 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 and mutable narrative uh, obviously remains with us today, and it's used to justify harms of the socioeconomic order um, that, that, that it runs on. And our, our socioeconomic order, as I see it, runs on competitiveness and, and greed and exploitation. And, and if I, let me go back to the American prison system to talk about like how I think racism continues to, ex to facilitate an exploitative system, right? And you can make simple arguments about like racism and the relationship between racism and socioeconomics, you know, in terms of uh, the prison system as exists today, warehousing, you know, disproportional numbers of black people um, in private prisons facilitates the capital interests of people who own those prisons, right? Um, and or or that you can call attention to like the 10 cents an hour wage that is paid to incarcerated workers. And the, those are are those are crazy injustices, right? But I think that in the larger scheme, the profits created through that kind of racist exploitation is actually kind of minor, actually. And I think that we begin to get a fuller sense of the way that racism and race lubricate unjust economic relations when we think about how race was used to facilitate Deregu the deregulation of the of the American economy and what we call like the neoliberal era, right? And so that deregulation created, helped to uh, enhance or intensify something that the, the sociologist uh, Loic Waquant calls the centaur state, right? You know, we have a state where um, it's like a centaur, has the human body up top and it has the hooves and body of the horse on the bottom, right? So. We, te we, we treat those at the top of the class structure, you know, with incredible humanity, and those at the bottom of the class structure get trampled on, like, with the, with the hooves of a horse. And so, you know, in, with the advent of neoliberalism, I think primarily in the 80s and 90s, you, we had this retraction of the social safety net. Right. And programs that were, you know, important to that dismantling of unions, offshoring and automation of, of labor and so forth. And that all helped to funnel the wealth into the utmost reaches of the class structure. And in order to quicken that that transfer, things had to be done. You know, we had to lower the tax burden at the top of the structure and so forth. And and that had to be done by cutting out social services at the bottom. Right. And, and, it, and that appealed and in that in that cutting out of the social service at the bottom, the way that that was facilitated was by through the mythology of race. Right. Welfare programs that offered low income people some protection from the teeth of the market. Those were racialized by those that that, that, that wanted the programs dismantled. Right. Political strategies were developed that associated those pro those programs with black people who were undeserving of the protections of the market and were defrauding the system, right? Never mind that that welfare fraud is not so common and that the great majority of welfare fraud is not committed by poor black people, but by the businesses that distribute these government funds. And never mind that welfare program, programs are, are for the great benefit of millions and millions of white people, right? The conjuring of the welfare queen, the black welfare queen, you know, tethered blackness to uh, these social services at the bottom for, that were beneficial to the people at the bottom of the class structure. And then that made it easier to discredit and dismantle those social services and therefore to then funnel wealth up to the top, right? So that's the process that has fundamentally sort of helped to move billions upon billions of dollars, right? Hundreds of billions 
up the up the class structure, right? That was facilitated by activation of the mythologies around race. And you know, there's 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 more of that. You know, the, the whole neoliberal turn away from Keynesian economic structures and so forth, you know, is facilitated by race. And I think that that's oftentimes not fully recognized when we think about the way that race facilitates and 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 creates socioeconomic order that we deal with today. So I mean, those are just a couple of things that I would say about that. Barbara, from your own perspective, how might you think about the, the relationship between um, identity formation, race, and um, the current socioeconomic order? I, I, I'm in a bit of a bind because I have to say that race and identity are concepts that I find useless. I don't use them. Um, and I, with my students, I, I talk about this quite a bit because like most Americans, or even if they're not Americans, they, they have been here enough to have picked up the lingo. So uh, they're usually puzzled when I say that. Um, but, and you understand why I say I don't believe in race, but identity, identity came uh, became popular among American uh, scholars and, and uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the chattering and, and scribbling classes here. It essentially was popularized by Eric Erickson. There are others who have, have uh, dealt with the concept, but I think he is the main influence bringing it to this country. And his conception, of identity was to do with an individual and it was the process by which the individual comes to him or herself, becomes the person from, from being a child, becomes the person that he or she is as an adult. It's a concept that applies to an individual. And without any thinking about it, we have uh, adopted that term as a collective term. But how can there be a collective identity? It has to be a, a non-identical identity if it's a collective. Uh, so I, I think that the terms are not helpful. Uh, what I use uh, in my own work and what I tell my students is that uh, there is such a thing as identifying and that's what we need to talk about. It's an identification. You may self-identify, but somebody else can identify you too. And racism is often a process of compulsory identification from outside. With my students, I, I, uh, at the, every year I give a lecture that I call the invention of race. And I talk about uh, several episodes in which uh, Afro-American police officers who were off duty, but saw a crime being committed and tried to tackle it, and then were killed by other police officers who mistook them for criminals. And I talk about that with my students and I tell them, look, those police officers, their identity in the sense of what they understood themselves to be was police officers and they were doing their job at that moment. But their colleagues identified them as criminals and that identification overrode those officers' identity to the extent that it left them dead. Uh, it's, it's a concept that I think we need to be a little bit more careful in thinking about because when, when it's a matter of collective, um, it's, it's really affiliation, which is something that you do by choice. It's not something that comes out of your ancestry. I don't have very much in common that I'm aware of with Clarence Thomas, even though you know we would be classified, we would be identified by others according to ancestry as having something in common. Uh, he's not someone with whose uh, political or judicial views I care to identify or affiliate myself. Uh, going back to the characterization of um, early America, 
I also want to say it's not quite accurate to say that American plantation owners justified their replacement of European labor uh, by racecraft. In fact, they didn't care who did their work. They came to a, a, a moment of emergency because the people who had come from Europe as indentured laborers were entitled to become free and to get land, for potentially become competitors of, of the landowners. Uh, but certainly they made trouble in Virginia. And uh, so it came about that the availability of African laborers and a decrease in the, the price at which they could be had, because the United States was uh, such a minor, uh, carried such minor weight in the, in the slave trade, that slave ships would not come to the mainland uh, colonies uh, as, their, as their first choice. The American slaveholders got what was left over after the sh slave ships stopped in the real heart. Of, of plantation America. So it, it was when it became somewhat less expensive to buy a slave for life and more ships were actually coming to the mainland that they became available to people in Virginia. But it didn't make any sense for them to buy a slave for life when slaves for life would probably not live more than five years but at the same time would cost them twice as much as to buy a servant for a term of five to seven years. So it as, it's as, as longevity increases for Afro-African servants that it then becomes to seem reasonable uh, that you spend twice as much money to buy this person. Uh, it, it wouldn't seem reasonable if you expected that person to die before the term could could uh, expire. So it's not a decision we're, we, we have to justify using uh, African laborers. It's that they came into a problem with having uh, white laborers gain their freedom and make trouble at a, the same time that because of demographic reasons and because of the growing efficiency of the slave trade, it made sense economically to pay what it cost to buy an African servant for life. Uh, any racecraft involved is a product of that historical uh, process. It, it's not the, the motive for it. Thanks very much. Um... So, you know, as we've been speaking about, the concept of race is often not just an illusion, um, but it can be a profoundly oppressive and destructive one. Um, at the same time, um, the case for jettisoning the category of race comes up against its role in a selective set of collective um, identities or, you know, forms of affiliation um, that carry genuine meaning and value. Um, identities around which deep solidarities and capacities for resilience have been forged, um, around which distinctive cultural expressions have emerged and flourished, and of course, around which vitally important histories and narratives are told and retold. Um, so how should we navigate this apparent contradiction between what we can all agree is a baseless, destructive concept and category, but on the other hand, those shared identities um, and patterns of communal relations, deep meanings and value that have emerged in relation to those oppressive identities over time. Um, so Barbara, maybe we can begin with you. Well, first of all, I would say that it, it is, it's arbitrary and I think it's mistaken to think that uh, when people form a, a group affiliation or identification as Afro-Americans or as black people, uh, that that's race. That's not race, <laughs> but it is being a people. And I, I have written about this in the past, the way that any uh, definition, identification of Black people is automatically translated. Uh, it, it's almost as though there's a glossary 
that translates that into race. But why does why does that have to be race? People can have a sense of uh, solidarity with each other. They can have a sense of uh, political affiliation with each other. And uh, if they are people of African descent who have been the targets of racism uh, in various forms in this country, there's no surprise that that's who it is, but there's nothing to say that uh, recognizing that and forming a political uh, solidarity on the basis of that is necessarily adopting race. We just, it, it, it always ends up being that way, doesn't it? Black, the black people have used various terms over our history in this country for talking, for referring to black people as a collective. Uh, and every one of those terms ends up being understood as a term about race, but why do, why do we think of it that way? Afro-American says something about people's geographic origin, and it also says something about, uh, or African-American, um, which I don't happen to prefer, but either. It says something about their geographic origin, sometimes remote, sometimes immediate, but it also says something about uh, joint experience of oppression in the United States. And uh, to say that, that those terms necessarily have to be understood as denoting race uh, is to, first of all, it's to assume what you need to prove, but second, it is to accept something that we need to throw off. It is not because of our ancestry that we uh, make a moral decision to be in solidarity with other people. We know too many people with the same ancestry who don't feel any solidarity with others. You know, and as I said, I don't feel any solidarity with Clarence Thomas, and I'm sure he feels none with me. Uh, or or uh, what's the woman's name, uh, Michelle Bachman or any of those. So there, there, there is nothing about the notion of race as it's been applied in this country that can be salvaged for, for uh, emancipatory purposes. And, uh, and that is not only in the sense that people can act together and act in solidarity without acting as a race you know, among themselves, but it is also a way of recognizing that um, our, our most effective way of trying to build the, the kind of society we want necessarily involves alliances with other people and recognizing where those alliances can be. Um, it doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to agree with people about everything. You know, when, when um, Christian Smalls and his colleagues uh, got people together at the Amazon warehouse and got them to vote uh, for a union, it was by virtue of their deciding these are the things we don't like about our workplace. These are the things we want changed. And you could have a conversation about that. I don't know him or, and I've never talked to the Amazon workers, but I will just say you can have a conversation about those things with people you don't agree with about, let's say, pronouns or people you don't agree with about uh, religion, or people you don't agree with about what ought to be in, in uh, school books. But if you can form an agreement with them about what you want to demand from Amazon, work on that. And then maybe some of those other things you can work on later on. But to assume that the only way we have of understanding our our moral obligations to each other has to be on the basis of accepting the category of race is to uh, allow the Trojan horse into the walls. So Derek, what might you have to add to this question about navigating the tension between the <clears throat> oppressive and illusory history of the concept of race, but the way in which 
um, it may have been associated with or um, stimulated certain kinds of collective identities that could have a real and lasting value today. Yeah, I mean, I think like my my thinking is a, a little bit different than than Barbara's in that, you know, I, I think the best future for race is one where we hold tightly like to the truth that race doesn't exist, right, on the one hand. Um, but we are also figuring out how to attend to like the disharmony and the inequalities and injustice and everything that that race has produced and I think that that for, to my mind you know again this is like a world making project you know this is like a real reshaping of like the human consciousness almost you know um and in that project I think that we need um you know we need to recognize that material resources and social honor have been unequally distributed through systems that are calibrated by race. And I think that we need a reparative system that is attentive to race. And so maybe that reifies like a falsehood, a category that was actually facilitated to create, you know, to, 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 to exploit. But I think that we have to have like this Janus face kind of approach, you know, like looking into a distant future where racism has been supplanted on the one hand, and thinking about how we can get there with, you know, means and ends that are coherent, but simultaneously, you know, looking at a racist past that determines our present order, right? And I think that that's the most productive way into the future. And, and I think, but I think that it's, you know, this is not just like a one way, like material, like I think that we don't have to just have like this the, in, in terms of reparations discourse, right? I don't think that this is just like a one way material reparations system, which um, material deficits are recognized among some people who are seen as the victims of history. Um, I don't think that that's all a reparative future would look like, right? I, mean, I think it would also look like um, recognizing that people who have been the chief targets, right, of racism have in response to that targeting built up cultures of capacity and cultures of resilience um, and mutualism, right? That may be key to world, the new world building processes that we, that can repair the harms of history. And, you know, like, for example, like we're familiar, you know, in the American context, most of us with like the fecundity of black creativity and, in, in, in the American context, we think about like the blues expressive tradition as a form of black resilience that runs through the blues, jazz, rock and roll, hip hop and all that. And we understand that that's the reflection or we talk about it as a reflection of a black culture of resilience, right? Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe, okay, it's just a culture of resilience, right? But nevertheless, it has been sort of sustained within a certain kind of cultural context that is associated with people who have this, you know, black somatite. And, but, and that, cre that, that sort of creativity has been easily exploited and commodified and, and all that. And I understand that and it recapitulates the same systems that are needed, you know, to, to that you need resilience to endure, right? But that kind of like expressive tradition, I think is, is the easily recognized um, sort of uh, um, partner of like a, like a, a kind of cultural tradition that has excelled in community building, you know? And, and in order to make a way out of no way, as you know, as the saying goes, you know, black people really excelled in what we could call like these ethical arts, these spiritual arts that human beings use to construct relationships in the face of grave oppressions. You know, so, so traditions of mutual aid, of faith in the future, of forbearance and compassion and love for justice, these are universal human capacities that have been refined and, per, you know, maybe this is too strong a word, but perfected in the context of Black cultures. And so, you know, we would never want to jettison those elements of you know, that Black cultural tradition that, you know, has developed those community building capacities, right? And in fact, we probably want to hold on to the cultural memory, the group identity 
that has cultivated those capacities that we're gonna are gonna be necessary for building the new world. And it seems to me what we want to do is jettison like the stigma that has been attached to certain races and the ideas of superiority that are attached to others. Um, and I think you know like that as we come to an understanding of human connection that can supplant racial hierarchy, you know, we maybe we can retain what is valuable in cultural histories and group identities that are now associated with race, but um, do away with the hierarchy of it, you know, and I know this is kind of like, this is, it's hard to imagine how that would work, but I think that there's something in that kind of process that, that we have to aspire toward. Barbara, I saw you moving your head during that um, that exchange. Do you, would you like to to add anything or, or respond? Yeah, a few things. First of all, um, it's not race that uh, underwrites injustice. It's racism, and it one of I I call it. Uh, the great evasion in American historical writing, mixing up those two things. Racism is, a, is an action. Mm -hmm. Race is a fiction. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing, let me just put this in, in the uh, most extreme, in, in the starkest way. If the uh, ending of injustice toward people of African descent in this country depends on the actions of people of African descent alone. It will never bloody happen. The, if we cannot find a way to fight injustice and inequality that uh, joins people across those divides, then it's not going to happen. Uh, inequality, which to me is, you know, it, 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 it's a broader category than racism. And racism does not have to involve inequality, but it certainly has been one of the, the generators, one of the engines of it. But the way to combat it is to be able to uh, to show how it blights the, the possibilities of everybody who isn't up there at the top. Uh, earlier on, I was struck by the statement that uh, people at the top need justifying ideologies. And, um, and it occurred to me that uh, while I think that's been true historically, you know, that people like to think of themselves as, as being decent and good and so on. It does strike me that at our moment, this present historical moment, uh, I think people at the top have never been so free in their own minds of any need to justify their position whatsoever. You know, it used to be, you know, the barons in medieval uh, times uh, justified their rule over other people, which included other people having to work for them, other people having to go to war at their behest and so on. Uh, but they justified it, at least in part, by offering protection, which you needed because, you know, you were living in an armed camp. I don't think our barons today even think they need to justify anything. They're immune from taxation the way the medieval barons were, but they're not saying that they provide this, that, or the other. They have so much money that they need to burn it off in rockets going to space and so on. And the idea that they owe anything to anybody else has just slipped completely away. And I think we need to turn that on our, our barons today. And black people uh, are not the only ones who need to turn it on those barons because our grievances are not going to be addressed if we're the only ones pushing them. But we share grievances with others. And it is because we do that I think we, we uh, stand a chance 
if we're politically skilled of act, actually making those grievances heard among people who share them uh, so that when black people complain about uh, the killing of black people by the police you know i look at articles about this and read comments on the comment board at the washington post and have and look at all the people who say well you know you, you should just comply well, we know perfectly well that that's not what these killings are about, but it is not publicly available knowledge that killings of unarmed people are disproportionately carried out against working class people. There's a racist disproportionality affecting black people, but white working people are targets of this sort of thing as well. And it's not in our interests for those people to read about attacks against black people and, and hear them opposed by people who don't recognize that it happens in, to other people. That's why I was delighted when I saw uh, Crump and um, uh, Al Sharpton show up on the scene where a young white boy had been killed by the police, you know, unarmed and, uh, you know, was it was uh, the sort of thing that police do because they can do it, and the uh, profile of the people to whom this happens who aren't black is so low that uh, it can be turned into something that they, you know, that happens to black people because black people don't listen, or because they're drug dealers, or because they do this or they do that. If we start uh, making a public issue of the fact that this is not just happening to black people, it's happening to black people disproportionately, but not to black people alone. Then we get at what a, a police state is like, what uh, protecting and policing inequality necessarily has to be for all the people who are uh, in, in the bottom 99% uh, of that society. And it, it's, it's a matter of self-interest for Black people to see the broader picture because nobody's going to care. If, if, if it looks as though we're the only ones suffering, who the hell is going to care? And as it happens, we're not the only ones suffering, even if we think we are suffering more than others. I think comparative suffering is, is, uh, is not a, a fruitful occupation anyway. But I, I think, uh, it, and in this, I, I have to recommend a book by Toure Reed. Uh, he's not Reed coincidentally, he's Adolf Reed's son, but he was also a graduate student here at Columbia. Um, and his recent book, uh, Toward Freedom, looks historically at those moments when it has been possible to make headway against injustices that Black people have suffered. And the point he makes again and again is that it has to do with being able to form alliances, having something that you can put on the table that makes it worthwhile uh, for someone to ally with you, but also they're having something worthwhile to put on the table that makes it worthwhile for you to ally with them. Otherwise, I think we are going to be crying forever. We're going to be mourning with our the, the families of victims forever. I, I'm so glad you... Um... You raise that point, Barbara, because I think it illuminates um, the fact that the recognition of our interdependence and mutual entanglement um, in the systems of society is key to the, the achievement, not, not just the conceptualization, but to the achievement of a, a meaningful and coherent justice. Um, I think these points relate to the final question that we had. So maybe I'll go there and then allow uh, Derek to also respond to these comments that Barbara just made. 
Um, unfortunately, we're, we're nearing the, time, the, the end of our time together. Um, so I'd like to ask you to reflect a bit more broadly on the role of collective identity, as it's often called, or identification, as Barbara uh, put it, in the pursuit of justice. And, and this is, I think, the topic we've been um, discussing for the last few minutes. As you know, there are various often contradicting views on this. On the one hand, a shared collective identity is often thought to serve as a useful or a necessary basis for solidarity and action. This is what you were referring to, Barbara. Um, identity is also thought by many to be essential to the proper recognition of injustice, that is, to the articulation and recognition of the harms suffered by particular groups or particular people. On the other hand, collective identities are also seen as divisive and counterproductive forces in society. For instance, pitting one identity against another, or as, as we uh, quite frequently see in contemporary discourse, assigning unabsolvable blame to certain peoples, or even attributing to them a uh, primordial or immutable racism. One of the things um, that I think we further observe in both public and academic discourse is that when considering the relationship of identity or identification to justice, what is often left out is the potential power of identifying with the human and the ways in which um, an all-encompassing human identity or identification might facilitate both the meaningful recognition of, of injustice and, and harm and cruelty and solidaristic action towards its redress. So I'd like to get your views on this. Derek, how do you see the relationship between identification with our shared humanity and the collective pursuit of justice? So, uh, you know, I think I would start by um, saying like the, the, you know, the collective pursuit for justice in a real sense, to my mind, means sort of engaging in world making projects, right? You know, like, as I see it, anti-blackness, you know, the ideology of race, racism, these are overarching sort of ideologies of modernity, and that what we need, and I, you know, I'm partly I'm sort of convinced of this through the work of Afro pessimists. Again, I don't come, I don't conclude where they conclude, but I, I do think that there is a kind of poisoning of the modern order such that what we require is its displacement, it's supplanting with something new, right? And there are younger scholars who are thinking about what you know, people call world making. And so uh, Femi uh, Taiwu has a book recently from Oxford called um, uh, uh, Reparations Reconsidered, right? And it thinks about it. So it does, it's not dismissive of identity politics, but it understands that identity politics as it's being played out in the contemporary world order is not, is not gonna get us where we need to get. And part of the reason for that is the reality of climate crisis, right? So he brings together reparations discourse and climate crisis to think about the need for creations of like really fundamentally new world orders. And he gets that from uh, an, another young scholar. Her name is uh, Adam uh, Getauchu. Like her argument is that these, you know, 20th century thinkers, you know, black political thinkers like Du Bois and Padmore and Manley and so forth, um, they believed that mere self-determination in the existing sort of uh, nation state system was not sufficient, right? And what we needed was the creation of a system of non-domination, not the less dominance for one group of people and, and more for another, but a system of non-domination. And so they're thinking about how to create a new world, right? And, you know, like, I, I think that that's the direction that we have to go in. Um, and part of the reason that I believe this um, is, as I said, because I feel like the system as, it, as it's now is irredeemably dysfunctional. I think that it may seem fantastical to think about, you know, world making and so forth, but I think it's also equally fantastical to look at the democratic system as we have in the U.S. and other parts of the world today and also think that that's somehow redeemable. It, it, it seems inevitable that this adversarialism accelerated and hype and heated in the way that it is now is somehow going to resolve itself. 
So I don't think that there's that there's that there's a, a possibility uh, th- in that direction. So we need to create new worlds, and and I think that as we do that, it will ultimately become more and more um, apparent that we are all one human family because the crises that we will face, such as the COVID pandemic, which is probably just a prelude to more intense pandemics that will come after, right? And climate disasters that are encompassing the world, right? Limited solidarities based only on race or national identity or whatever we want are not going to be up to the challenge of the shrinking world and the accelerating technology that's bringing us all together um, that that we're going to face, right? So we have to think about solidarities on the largest scale, on worldwide scales, human solidarities. And and that's what attracts me to the idea of world making. You know, for us to flourish in centuries and decades to come, we'll have to become more mature as a human family. And we'll have to realize that we need new world systems that account for the needs of everyone, especially the most destitute and stigmatized. And as I see it, the current world order with its adversarial solidarities benefits those who are already powerful, you know, right now. And if my group or my race just battles with the established power using the logic, the logic and the strategies of, of power, of established power, then I think we're destined to lose. It's playing a rigged game. It's dancing when people tell you to dance, right? And so for me, hope lies in building communities, even very small ones, that are committed to the broadest forms of solidarity and are very alive to the world shaping mythologies like racism and so forth, but which account for contemporary and historic racism right now while trying to tell new stories about who we are and what we can become in this world that we want to build. Barbara, what about you? How do you, how do you see the relationship between identifying with the human and the, the collective pursuit of justice? I don't think human beings do very well with abstractions. And the human race is an abstraction. People can't live in that. So I, I uh, keep coming back to Barrington Moore's notion that people can agree on uh, suffering that they do not want better than that they can agree on a world that they do want. And to me, that suggests the, that uh, you, you begin with whatever group you, you, uh, you can uh, form a, a, an agreement with uh, for political action about getting rid of some uh, circumstance, some situation, some practice that people all agree we don't want that. And that may expand from the level of, by thinking back to the, the teachers who were striking in, in a, a state, what, what are generally known as red states because they wanted larger salaries. You know, you think about the, the sort of things that, pe- that can bring people together to end some very concrete form of suffering that they don't want. And from there, you may be able to uh, grow to larger uh, identifications, larger forms of solidarity. But I don't think you can start with an abstraction. People won't see themselves in that. Well, Barbara Field. Oh, sorry, Ben. Did you want to? Did you want to put in a question? Uh, a question? No, that was it. Just a thank you. Okay. Well, well, I think Ben was gonna, gonna do what I was gonna do, which was to thank uh, Barbara Fields and Derek Smith for uh, joining us today and engaging in such a deeply thoughtful conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much. And also, we wanted to give uh, thanks to our sponsors, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University and the Center on Modernity and Transition. And of course, thanks to all the participants for joining us. We hope you'll join us again in two weeks on Friday, May 6th, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, when we will have the great pleasure of welcoming Juliet Hooker and Samuel Moyne to discuss identity, liberalism, and democracy in America. So see you all next time. Derek, Barbara, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.